The city was something I came to for my student years. While London was the destination, in my mind it was the city, something distinctly different to the material buildings and peoples to which I would come to know. To me, all that was imminent was the negation of what I was leaving behind, the English countryside in Sussex where the bird call was the loudest part of the day, signifying dawn and dusk. At the moment of my arrival, I found it a connection with a place I would slowly learn to walk and hear, to smell and remember parts of the day, parts of the city, parts of a small selection to which I would now call home. The longer I stayed, the more my relationship with the city grew, and the more I conversed with fellow students about their experiences. Not with intention, but simply due to our sharedness of space, our own relationship to which we held in unity. Don't hold your phone at night. I hate the London Bridge area because it reminds me of my loneliness. I hear Fintry Park is dangerous to walk at night. You should check out Goldbourne Road because everyone is mad and beautiful there. Each statement holds within them a relationship to a space different to mine, that the commonality between them, London as place, is the vessel for their memories, their connections, their pain, their love, my pain and my love. Wim Wenders' film, Wings of Desire, depicts angels wandering the streets, hearing only the innermost desires of those that find shelter within the divided city of Berlin and the comments of other angels. The protagonist, Damiel, meanders through the streets, buildings, peering not only into thoughts, but across the city at large, without direct purpose, without a definitive aim. Damiel is a wanderer. Occasionally, the angels will come across someone who is in turmoil, who is in prayer, who is in need of a whisper or a presence. Responding with a gentle hand, a silent lullaby, the angel makes their presence felt, but never known. Their ultimate cause is to observe, to listen, and to acknowledge without direct interference. They are by nature not corporal, and therefore permanently distanced. Do not experience worldly effects. In his seminal piece, Wim Wenders presents us with the divine embodiment of the Fulaneur, a literary type formulated by Walter Benjamin are the poetry and literary criticisms of the romantic Charles Baudelaire. The flaneur is outside of time and a besmitten child, says Benjamin, a sentiment very much echoed within Wings of Desire. Damiel and the angel Cassio are depicted to be visible only to the children of Berlin. Within Walter Benjamin's unfinished masterpiece, The Arcades Project, the flaneur is the man of the crowd, which assumes some kind of familiarity between the specific and the general, between the individual and the group, a familiarity of humanity, which is, at first, not shown by vendors through his focus on the divine. Within a group, between one another, there is difference. This difference within the group establishes a relationship of fragments, a collection of puzzle pieces fitting together not due to sameness, but difference. The role of the flaneur catalyzes this notion of difference through observation and distance. It forces a perception of a fragmentary nature to accommodate a larger street and even larger city, illuminating the multiplicity nature of the inhabitants. Through the lens of the flaneur, the peoples of the city become a heterogeneous mass of difference who move around each other interminably, knowingly or not, every day. The urban theorist, Michel de Soto, describes those that walk the city as wandersmanner, wanderers, who find themselves moving through a sprawl of illegible urban text, a communicatory text written and followed unknowingly. If one were to take a step back and observe the space they occupy, they may notice that those who simply pass by notice footsteps as noise, but when listened to, they can become sound, even music, each individual holding a cadence. When footsteps become cadences, the busy street becomes poetic expression, an intricate symphony. To the non-observer, the everyday walker, there is little knowledge of this space which surrounds them. Instead, they are to the space, blind as that of lovers in each other's arms. Nascent to what is outside of their embrace, the lovers hold themselves in a tight embrace. One's relationship with their use of space becomes theirs and theirs alone. For Paris c'est une blonde, and no one loves her like I do. The manner in which lovers communicate is that of movements between figures of discourse. This discourse can be at times dominating and at others fertile with possibility. Similarly, 
The discourse of a space one inhabits can be dominated by an ideology, a fascistized purpose installed to dominate its mode of use and thus attempt to dominate one's relationship to that space in a homogenizing manner. In one of my own wanderings, I came across Barra Market, a space that can only be described as liminal by the time of my arrival, that being once it had shut. No longer a bustling food market aimed towards sating the tourists, the middle classes, and the local bankers, Barra Market after hours is a dark labyrinth of eeriness with no purpose. Deserto presents the dominating potentiality of the city through a short introduction of the panoptic World Trade Center in New York. His discussion ending in a three-stage process. This three-stage process accumulates into the notion of the city concept. The city concept can be seen as a creation of space devoid of history and external influences. The city concept is standalone against external factors which would compromise it and actualizes this through a process of universalization. The city concept appropriates all that is fragmented into a singular whole. What was once univocal becomes binary. The inhabitants, once individually diverse, become part of a new all-consuming class, cosmopolitan. The city becomes universal, the cosmopolitan child finding familiarities whichever city they find themselves in. This notion of city concept echoes the narrative of fear presented within the dialectic of enlightenment, the fear of a new totalitarian regime brought on through an approach to radical rationalism and utilitarianism, festering itself within a capitalist, utopian dream of homogenization. Vara Market finds itself within the London Bridge area of London, sharing its space with a similarly all-occupying structure to the World Trade Centers of New York, the Panoptic Shard. Opening in 2013, the shard was named through a criticism delivered by English Heritage, stating, a shard of glass through the heart of historic London, delivering an opaque critique of the nature of this building, a building which holds itself completely disregard to the historic land it inhabits, dominating the space in a manner which forces itself separate from the land, while at the same time becoming the United Kingdom's tallest building. Similarly, the Guardian was also critical of the Shard, labelling it as just luxury flats and hotels, without function past being hospitable for the super-rich. In consequence of the Shard's dominating presence, the land surrounding becomes known no longer for itself, but identified as near the Shard, specifically for those who are new to London like I was. The Shard, historyless and intimidating, becomes a landmark and first point of identification of a space which is for the most part, castrated from what the Shard concept represents. The Emporous judges of the Emporous Skyscraper Award themselves stated that the Shard is already considered London's new emblem, a building which encapsulates London's already heavily propagated narrative towards the mega-rich. In contrast to the well-endowed Shard, Borough Market finds itself within a long and historic practice of operations. Believed to have begun around 1014, the market found itself within a tenuous relationship with the monarch during the majority of its operations, until it became a charity-run trust in 1767. With the takeover of the supermarkets in the 1980s, a more private business supplying bar market started to fall short of sales, and in 1998, it began to rebuild itself towards a more public face, becoming over time a food specialist market for the regular shopper while maintaining its wholesale nature in the early mornings. While the market holds a long history of inclusivity, its more affluent customers are still reflected within its style. Cole, in his piece, Making the Marketplace, a topography of Bar Market London, presents the market as a fine, ethical alternative. The food market and its catering post-Renaissance, as the website likes to put it, is orientated more towards the artisan good, consequently driving prices higher. While by day, Barra Market is a busy, vibrant, multi-sensory consumptive experience, come nighttime, Barra Market becomes desolate, boarded up and strange. Here we are presented with a space which has with it little purpose, other than to wait until the early morning trading hours. The phenomenological impact of this liminality, the affect of being in Barra Market after hours, is one of airiness. Here I am presented with a place of which designated purpose is no longer present. 
to which I find myself in a deserted enclosure, a multi-story consumptive experience of liminality. The urban text is laid out in the space of Baramarca and appears in clarity, no longer blind, I find the lover I held so tightly losing their grip. I am forced to account my relationship to the space before me. The nature of this encounter completes a full U-turn away from the all-encompassing city concept. The felt liminality of the space, stripped from the original concept, forces a new personal account of space and adherence to the felt liminality. My first reaction was one of eeriness. The urban text appears due to my homogenized concept of Baramarket, that being lively and bustling, falling apart. Through an affection of isolated airiness, the spatial relations between myself and the market reveals itself to be a more personal reaction rather than a dominant-led conceptual narrative. Cole states, in the daytime, Borough Market is a work composed through individual narratives that are assembled and disassembled at night. What I encountered was the disassembled Borough Market, a naked space stripped of narratives with the exception of my own, a narrative of liminality to which I later shared with friends. This assemblage of narratives is no different with the Shard. The Shard itself was designed by the architect, Renzo Piano, and while he himself states that he designed the Shard to express its sharp and light presence in the urban panoramic of London, a sentiment repeating that of Deserto's city concepts strive to panoptic functions. It is not so simple, however. Piano designed the Shard around various spires in London, such as churches and masts of tall ships, wishing for the building to appear as a spire-like sculpture emerging from the River Thames. These historic buildings themselves came to fruition within their own socio-historical contexts, made by their own architects and designers. A major factor within the completion of the project was a partnership with the state of Qatar, where the Prime Minister of Qatar himself opened the building. The Shard, therefore, does represent a strife towards a panoptic city concept building, yet, at the same time, it is an embodiment of political relationships with Qatar, as well as accumulation of historic processes to which the architectural designs of London, its churches and maritime structures, were themselves produced through. In this sense, the Shard, similarly to Borough Market, becomes an assemblage of fragmented narratives, both on the political and historical side, but also, and most extremely so, within the poetic image of the individual Renzo Piano, whom gave birth to the Shard's design. Within the experience of spatial liminality, the urban text becomes legible. Acknowledgement of the assemblages surrounding a space brings to surface a fluctuating relationship between the individual and the space they inhabit. All at once, the individual becomes illuminated by the changing, wandering urban text that has seeped into their being, holding, churning, and moving along their relationship to the space they inhabit. Buildings within a city becomes the embodiment of narratives, histories, and experiences that could be considered a crystallization of this urban text. They are an assemblage of individuals who are the designers along with all their influences, who themselves held their own relationship to the city. However, if crystallization produces staticness, then buildings as crystallization would disregard the hidden wandering narrative to which the writings of the urban text is attributed by Deserto, as well as is linked to the everyday. As Deserto states, one of the most obvious modes of disrupting the city concept, and thus illuminating its flaws, as well as being the main distributor of urban text, is identifiable within the practices of walkers on the ground, who possesses an innate flannery which cannot be accurately predicted or ever traced, only mapped. In an attempt to create one of my own mappings, I drew my own daily walks to the local park over a period of a week, walks without intention other than that to go to the cafe in the centre. These drawings show the differences of streets and wanderings undertaken each day, a difference which illuminates the walker's innate disregard for urban design within the premise of moving between A to B, thus indicating the need for a more nuanced understanding of one's relationship to space. In lines of viewing urban text as something which is mobile, wandering itself, it becomes inappropriate for it to be read as a static fictional value, or a completed substance, but rather as a poetics, something which is read as multiplicity, something which holds the power to affect, 
but whose modes of affection cannot be determined as universal. As urban text becomes poetic, it's productive to entwine De Certo's concept of urban text with Gaston Bachelard's Poetics of Space. Through the land of Bachelard's study of the poetics, urban text becomes resonance and reverberation, an inseparable doublet of poetic affect. De Bachelard, reverberations occur when one speaks a poem. The poem becomes one's own to the extent where it brings about a chain of being, a being of becoming from the reader towards the poet. This movement brings about an awakening of poetic creation through the reverberations of the poetic image. Resonance is what follows reverberation, sentimental repercussions reminding us of our past. The original poetic image transfuses to become one's own. The reverberation is the root of the image installed within oneself, and resonance is the growing and flourishing of the image to the point that it resembles a creation of one's own rather than that of the poet. The poetic image is in a process of becoming, is appropriated by the reader, sublimated into their imagination, as if the image was their own to begin with. Within the city, urban text represents a communicative poetic image en masse. Reverberations become a catalyzed phenomenon through the immediate shared relationship with the city. When Frank O'Hara writes his lunch poems on an early 1960s afternoon in New York, the reader from London has a point of connection already in their mind, the ambleness of the lazy afternoons as they pass the windows of shops, the reader embodies a sentiment to which they know but have not exactly lived, O'Hara's embodiment of the city. When Barbara Guest talks of imagined happenings on the empty midsummer piazzas, we are enticed to imagine our own reveries overlooking similarly open spaces. When our friend mentions the dangers of Finsbury Park at night, we are exposed to a reverberation of an experience which may or may not have been embodied by the speaker themselves, yet they are still affected enough to limit their use of space and in turn attempts to influence our own. The textures of spatial conversations hold an obvious amount of influence towards one's relationship to space. However, the most dominating influences to one's relationship to a space are the collected fragmentary ruminations that are hidden even to the most perceptive onlooker. Collected over time, these fragmented reverberations become resonant within the individual affected, or not, by actual personal experiences. An individual's relationship to the city can thus be seen as a collection of fragmentary occurrences, occurrences which happen not only through living and being within the city, but also outside and even without ever stepping foot within the space. It is this which could be understood as truly urban text. The blind embrace of the walkers and their space can thus be understood as the isolated nature of an individual's experience of said space, an embrace determined through a collection of fragmentary experiences. The inhabitants' experience of the city is invoked and affected through the process of resonance and reverberation in a fragmentary, everyday manner. The city becomes a personal collage of spatial fragmentary experiences, and thus is neither fixed nor complete. The inhabitants' experiences within the various spaces of the city as place accumulates in the birth of a relationship no longer to one specific space, but to a transient personal space my city, which is embraced by the subject. My city does not exist as an objective entity, but is a relationship produced from an assemblage of experiences, and thus distinctly different from the fact of London the place. This assemblage of experiences accumulating in my city hold their origins within the personal everyday life within the city, memories one has collected. This personal relationship to my city appears hidden to the walker, who themselves sees their city as a whole, as a place. But it's not a city as a place they speak of, but their my city, their city, their en blonde, not Paris itself, but a transient collection of fragments. My city is always unique, always evasive and all-consuming, for the subject conjoins their soul to the space they inhabit, imprinting the personal to that space, whether through their own experience or the sublimation of others. My city holds itself in distinct opposition to the dominative narratives which ideologies attempt to assert within the city concept, and what can be understood as urban text 
is a conversation between all the fragmented my cities within the actual city as place. The experiences I had of Baramaka and the Shard are fragments of my city, investigated further in a search to find out the source of the liminality I felt during my wander into a space stripped of its purpose. Vim Vendors illustrates the discoveries of my investigation. Wings of Desire pictures transforming relationships to the city, visualising motifs of heteronuity, both between the inhabitants as well as their deeply personal relationship to the space they are depicted within. As the film plays on, the angel Damnion is drawn by Marion, a solitary trapeze artist who is lost in depression, and Damiel begins to yearn for worldliness, to shed his angelic duties, to no longer observe, but simply to be. This yearning takes root when Damiel meets Peter Falk, an angel who chose to become mortal. Preaching the wonders of touch to Damiel, he describes the simple wonders of mortality. It is this speech conjoined with his affections for Marion, which pushes Damiel to forgo his angelic duties and join the world of man. Damiel takes very little interest in the building, city concepts or ideologies. Damiel already knows that the city is fragmented into all its individuals and affects. It is the very individual and affects which drew Damiel in joining the world to begin with. Simultaneously, Cassiel tries to save a young man on top of a building but ultimately fails. His death torments Cassiel for the remainder of the film. Caught up in his struggles, he ignores Damiel talking of the wonders of the world. Yet it is very separatedness which led his touch to be ignored by the young man. Wenders presents us with a depiction of his Berlin, a place which holds the wonder and brutality of life, a heterogeneous society of a multiplicity nature, a city as place, divided by ideologies into two different city concepts, yet the fragmented masses within the share, between them differences which extends beyond any attempt of universalization or registration to ideals, a difference of affect, a difference of humanness, a difference only being in the world can produce, and a difference which Damiel now finds himself a part of. Wim Wenders' Berlin, shown in Wings of Desire, thus becomes an imitated microcosm of his city, or his understanding of a Berlin specific to its time. Wings of Desire, the film, can be seen not only as a microcosm of the my city in context, but also the elusive urban text. Will you stay in a lover's story? If you stay, you won't be sorry, cause we believe in you. Soon you'll grow, so take a chance with a couple of cooks hung up on romancing. Will you stay in a lover's story? If you stay, you won't be sorry Cause we believe in you Soon you'll grow So take a chance with a couple of